Today, we are in Colossians chapter 2, and we're looking at verses 6 through 8, and we're uh, doing part 2 of a multi-part series called Centered in Jesus, the all in all. And I was actually just uh, thinking uh, about my subtitle um, and praying through that just right here as I was coming up here, and, and the Spirit, I think, said to me, change it, so we are. And I'm changing it to, what are you captivated by? So um, if you want to do that on your notes, you can. But what are you captivated by? And, and you can be thinking through that. What am I captivated by? And, and, and of course, the answer is, who are we to be captivated by? And that is Jesus, the all in all. He is to captivate us. Let's uh, begin to read here in Colossians chapter 2. Uh, Verse 6, it says, Therefore, as you received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him. And and we want to be in Jesus, uh, immersed in his work and what he's done. So walk in him. And then we're rooted, we're built up in him and established in the faith, just as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving. Verse 8. Oh, I'm not going to read both. So, how is Jesus received? That's a good question. How do we receive Jesus? Okay. And we receive Jesus by faith. By faith. As defined by Ephesians 2, 8 through 10. It says, for by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not of your own doing, it is a gift of God. And we we know that God's grace is free and that he gives it to everyone. And God gives faith to those whom he chooses. And, And I think he gives everyone a measure of faith. And the question is, do we respond to the faith that he has given us? And to respond to faith that has been given to us is to believe, you see. Faith is the noun. Believe is the verb. It's the action. Not a result of works so that no one may boast. We are saved by grace through faith so that it is not of ourselves. It is a gift of God so that we cannot say, look what I've done. Look how good I am. No, we are sinners saved by grace, and now that we are saved, we are sons and daughters of the king, not by our own merits, but by his grace. So that we have nothing to boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus. Where are we created in? Christ Jesus, for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. And walk in Jesus because that's where we find the source of our good works. How then are we to walk? We are to walk by faith. Actually, 2 Corinthians 5, 1 through 10 speaks to that about our walk in faith. Verses 4 through 7 speak to the main idea. It says, for while we were still in this tent, speaking of our bodies, we were groaning, being bored, and not that we would be unclothed, but that we would be further clothed, so that what is, so that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life, or swallowed up by what is immortal. Here, here, groans about their body once in a while. You get out of bed, it makes some creaks and groans, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Sitting in a pew, and you're like, gee, I wish they'd just church would get more comfortable chills my back is killing me right or 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 maybe i don't know maybe you're fighting cancer and you're like this tent is groaning maybe maybe you're just fighting a cold right maybe you have gut problems like me and you're just like i wish my bowels would just get straight it's groaning right But he who prepared us for this very thing is God, who has given us the Spirit as a guarantee. Meaning this body is not all there is. I'm going to get a new body. It's going to be a glorified body. He's going to clothe me further. And he has given me the Holy Spirit as a guarantee of that power that he is going to work in my life. And that he is working in my life today. So we are always of good courage, amen? 
we know that while we're at home in the body, we're away from the Lord. For we walk by faith. Faith in what God is going to do. Faith in what God is doing, not by sight. Amen? So where does our faith rest? Our faith must be centered. It must be rested, if you would, in Jesus, the all in all. Jesus is all the air that we breathe. Paul uses the three terms for how we walk by faith centered in Jesus. The first term is rooted. Rooted. Rooted is an agricultural term that speaks of the vitality of the plant. If you're a horticulturalist like my wife, then she plants a plant. She'll dig a plant up out of the ground, and she won't sell it until it's rooted out. She says, I don't want to sell plant that might die. So I won't sell it, or I won't give, or even give it away until it's rooted out. The plant that is rooted out will be much more vigorous than the one that has a poor root system, or that was just ripped up out of the ground and shoved in a pot and said, here, right? She wants it to be rooted out. And then we also know that what the roots are in matters, right? If you put clay soil in the pot and you're like, yeah, plant, grow, is it going to grow? No, it won't root out, right? It won't find life. And so we, it matters what we're rooted in, right? And so we must be rooted, uh, our plant must be rooted in good soil. We must be rooted in Jesus with a vigorous root system, right? And, and we get rooted out, uh, we get uh, in a good root system by walking by faith in him. And, and our faith is strengthened as we respond to what he teaches us in his word and how we talk and engage with him throughout our day, right? Now, it, you have a relationship with somebody, and if you never talk to them, you know that that relationship doesn't go very well, Right? They usually get upset, or they don't even think you like them anymore, or whatever. God doesn't think you don't like them anymore, but if you want your relationship, and you want to be rooted, and you want a vigorous root system, you got to be in the Word. you got to be talking to God in your life. you got to spend time with Him more than, hey, God, see you later, right? It's got to be... Wow, I need to figure out what God says. I need to figure out what God is teaching me. You know, I need to get in fellowship. I need to be in this mindset that God is with me all the time and that he wants to share life with me. So, hey, God, I'm so glad you're with me today. Let's go do grocery shopping. (laughs) Right? Oh, hey, God, I'm so glad you gave me this Bible that I can read, whether it be on my phone, right, or in, in a book. Oh, you know what? I'm going to spend some time reading it, right? And seeing what it says. And I'm not just going to read it because that's what pastor said to do. No, I'm going to read it like a journalist. I'm going to read it inquisitively, and I'm going to figure out what you have for me, right? So walking by faith. The second talk is built up. Built up is a construction term. If you've ever uh, done construction, uh, it, we, we build up a house. We, we, we use it, um, and we build up from the foundation. Never seen anybody build a house with no foundation. Never seen anybody put the roof on first. Ever? No. It doesn't work that way, right? You'd have to have a crane hold it the whole time, Right? Then you'd have to have some really good hurricane straps to hold the walls onto the roof until you got the foundation uh, put in. Now, I've seen houses that have been built with really bad foundations. And then they come in afterwards, right? And they put all these beams in and, and jack the house up and then come in and put the foundation. And you're like, man, they did that backwards, right? And I'm sure there's like plaster cracking everywhere, right? We build up from the foundation. Right? We don't build down because we can't start at the top. Right? So the idea is we build up on Jesus, the foundation of our lives, the very cornerstone upon which our lives are built. Right? 
cornerstone. It's like in the ancient times, uh, the cornerstone had two, two roles depending on where they were, the context. The first cor- one was it was the cornerstone that they set all the other stones for the foundation off of. And, and they would make all their measurements off. You know, when we, when we build a house now, we get all lasers out and, and, and we lay out strings and, and then we set that corner pin. Bam, right? And that's what everything is pulled off of, right? Until we get the forms in and then the footing poured, right? He's, he is the cornerstone. He's that point of reference. Everything is based off of that. The other term it's used in a different context is when they're building arches. And then there's a keystone. And if you take the keystone out, what happens to the arch? <laughs> it falls down. So it is the idea of everything is being built off of. It is the idea that uh, he is supporting all of it. Right? And he is the support for all of our lives. The third term is established. And an established is communication of endurance. It speaks of full assurance of Christ being reliable, established, established in the faith. Faith speaks of the system of belief which Jesus established through his death and resurrection. And he explained that system of belief through his teaching and the teaching of the apostles. In other words, the New Testament and the Bible, you see. And so we have this opportunity to be established in the faith, rooted, built up, established, not going anywhere, right? When we walk by faith centered in Jesus, we become established in the faith once for all, delivered to the saints. Walking in relationship with Jesus, being in the Word, being in prayer, being in fellowship establishes us in the faith. So none of this is caught passively, right? This is not just something you get by osmosis. It must be taught. Just as you were taught, that's what the verse says, right? So part of my job is to teach. So what is part of your job then? It is to learn, right? If I'm teaching you, then you should be learning. Part of being a good student is to be reading, to be in the Word, to be listening, right? To be applying what is said. We must be students of the Word to walk by faith centered in Jesus. We must uh, learn to have relationship and to exercise our relationship with God throughout our day so that we can be built up and established in Him. This is so important. To not being taken captive. Remember at the beginning, I asked you, what are you being taken captive by? This is so important. So who are we in? We're in Jesus. But I ask you this, what are you being taken captive by? What are you being taken captive by? Because we're in Jesus, what should well up in our hearts? The reality of being in Christ, what should well up? What wells up? Gratitude, right? Thanksgiving. Gratitude for what Jesus Don is doing and will do. Thanks be to God for his indescribable gift of Jesus. Amen? Amen. Gratitude. So Colossians 2.8 brings us back to this question I asked you at the beginning. What takes you captive? See, Colossians 2.8 says, See to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit according to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of the world, and not according to Christ. What takes you captive? Being rooted, built up, and established in Jesus safeguards us from being taken captive by philosophy and empty deceit. Okay? It's a safeguard. 
Doesn't mean it doesn't still somewhat creep in, but it definitely prevents it. And if you're not rooted and not built up and not established in the faith, it is far easier to be taken captive by philosophy and empty deceit. So I ask you again, what takes you captive? What catches your attention? And when once it catches your attention, it captivates you. And without the work of the Spirit in your life to set you free with the truth of God's word embodied by Jesus, then you will be captive. Philosophy. Philosophia in the Greek. It's only used here in the New Testament. Interesting. Paul is using the word to speak of worldly wisdom. In fact, uh, Sophia, we like that name. We name our kids that sometimes, Sophia. You know what that means in the Greek? It means wisdom. Okay, Sophia. And then philo is like worked out wisdom, so philosophy. So here it's worldly wisdom, a, a worldly system of Belief, worldly systems of belief. Now, I might step on some toes here, and I'm just giving you a heads up. So, some examples of those worldly systems of belief would be evolutionism, naturalism, capitalism, com- communism, materialism, socialism. Okay? These are worldly systems of belief. The list could go on and on. There are many, many worldly systems, many philosophies in the world. Many of them have an effect on our day-to-day lives, especially, especially the ones that have crept in unnoticed. And they've crept in unnoticed as a result of being in the world. And they are taking you captive. And they've crept in because you're not spending time or enough time with Jesus. And now you've been taken captive by these. And you know what happens when they take your mind captive? They begin to affect what you believe. And so I ask you the challenging question again. What has taken you captive? Paul says we are to see to it that we are not taken captive by these. And this takes intentionality since they tend to creep into our thinking. They do. You know what a really big one that creeps into our thinking or my own thinking is naturalism. Thinking that uh, putting priority over the natural processes and the natural things of life rather than spiritual things, you see? Thinking that and feeling that what I have here is all I've got. That's a system of belief called naturalism. And it has other outworkings and, and things too if you go extreme in it. So what are the worldly philosophies that have crept into your thinking? thus taking you captive. I, I, I want you to take some time to think about that, to, to reflect on that, and, and to think about how those things have, have uh, tainted or, or colored your, your perspective. One thing that, that happens at, at times is this whole theory of theistic evolution. Did you know evolution is not at all a biblical uh, godly thing. Evolution is an await reason to explain why there isn't a God. And yet then smart men and, and smart women say, well, maybe it was theistic evolution. What's happened? In my opinion, it has crept in to their thinking and it is affecting their system of belief. What has crept into your thinking? Empty deceit or vain deceit. It speaks of the lies that we believe. We believe lies. We believe lies about God. 
We believe lies about our world. We believe lies about our family. We believe lies, lies about ourselves, don't we? And we become captivated. We become formed. Our actions or acting out becomes, uh, deto- is determined by the lies that we believe. And we all struggle with believing lies. If you say, I don't struggle with believe- believing lies, then you've l- believed a lie that you don't struggle with believing lies. Because we all struggle with believing lies. This is a reality. There's all deceit within our hearts. There's all places where where truth has not yet shined and we are deceived. And it's empty because of the work of the cross, but it's only empty when we don't believe it. (laughs) When we believe it, it has a profound effect on our life, right? When we believe a lie as truth and act on it, it brings forth bad fruit or poisonous fruit in our lives. As Galatians 6, 7 through 9 says, do not be deceived, right? Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. mocked. For whatever one sows, that will he also reap. For the one sows his own f- in, to his own flesh will reap where from the flesh reap corruption. But the one who sows to the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. And let us not grow weary of doing good. Let us not go, grow weary of sowing in the Spirit. For in due season we will reap if we do not give up. I'm so glad the Apostle Paul said that we needed to sow in the Spirit, because the Spirit of God has been given us to lead us in all truth. And He is the one that shows us the lies that we believe so we can stop believing those lies and sowing in the flesh, sowing in corruption. And when it's talking about the flesh, it's not talking about my physical body, it's talking about my fallen nature, which is a tendency to believe lies. So I encourage you to follow Paul's command here and see to it that you're not taken captive by vain deceit or by lies you believe. This is important. Many of us are suffering from lies we believe. So how do we guard against being deceived and discover where we are deceived, right? Because all of us are deceived somewhere. And how do we do that? First, we center on Jesus, the all in all. That's important. It, he's our foundation, right? We're rooted in him. We're built up in him. We're grounded in him. We're established in him. It's Jesus, right? And his work on the cross demonstrated through the resurrection. So we center on Jesus. Second, we ask the Holy Spirit to reveal to us where we are deceived. Where am I deceived? Search my heart, O oh God. Try me. See if there is any way in me that does not glorify you. What lies have I chosen to believe? Because Jesus said in John 16, 13, that when the spirit of truth comes, he will guide you in all truth. For he will not speak of his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will declare to you the things that are to come. So the Spirit of God is to say, that is a lie. Here is the truth. Believe the truth. But to hear what the Spirit of God has to say is uh, a step of faith where we have to open our hearts, open our, our, ourselves to hear where he, he has to say to hear the truth that he is speaking to us. A good psalm to pay, pray through would be Psalm 25. Um, and you could pray through the whole psalm. Um, one through five is a good start. It says, To you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. Oh my God, I trust in you. Let me not be put to shame. Let not my enemies exalt over me. And none who wait for you shall be put to shame. They shall be ashamed who are wantonly treacherous, make me know your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths. Lead me in your truth and teach me, 
for you are the God of my salvation. For you I wait all day long. God, Jesus, the Holy Spirit, the Trinity, three in one, is the source of truth in our lives. You know, it's not enough just to hear truth. We have to believe it. So third, we are to respond to the deceits revealed to us by believing the truth he is teaching us. So when he says, this is a lie, right? We have to recognize, oh, yep, you're right. That is a lie. And this is how I've justified it and rationalized it to be right. But yes, it is a lie. And I choose to believe the truth of what Scripture says. These lies takes all kinds of form. Sometimes the lie is you're not forgiven. God won't forgive you for this, right? And we believe that. That's a lie. Most of the time, lies are rooted and born out of shame. And who bore the shame for us? He who knew no sin became sin. He bore the shame for us on the cross so that we don't have to live in shame because we are what? Forgiven. Forgiven. So respond to the truth by believing this, this associating Choosing not to believe the lie. And though it's hard, because often these lies we believe are lives we've believed a long, long, long time. And they're ingrained. They've taken us captive for many, many years. And I just want to let you know that the Spirit of God is calling you out of that lie and into the truth. And it says that if you shall know the truth, and the truth is Jesus, and the truth shall set you free. And I know we all want to be free, free from the deceit, free from the sin, free from the shame, free from the lies in our lives. And so I implore you, center on Jesus. Ask the Spirit to show you the lies that you believe and respond to his prompting, believing the truth that he reveals to you. Many of us are living in misery because of the lies we believe. So I just, again, please take the time to come before the throne of grace and ask the Holy Spirit to lead you in all truth so that you can walk with, so he can walk with you to take care of the lies that have crept in. And keep going to him. Because those lies are like whack-a-mole sometimes. <laughs> and we find ourselves falling back into the same old thought patterns, the same, same old broken reasonings. And, and so keep going back to him the throne of grace where we receive mercy and grace to help. So these worldly philosophies and lies that we believe, they're according to two categories. The first category is according to human tradition, meaning they have been established by humanity and not by God, okay? So they're according to human tradition. Is not an attack on having tradition, okay? There are lots of good tradition out there, uh, but it's a warning that we are not to have human tradition take us captive from the traditions God has established for us in Jesus, the all in all. A tradition that Christ has established was, do this in remembrance of me, right? Called communion. That is a tradition, now, we shouldn't do that tradition just with rote. No way, right? We do that with meaning and intent. But do this in remembrance of me, this tradition established by God. 
But there's lots of other traditions um, that can take us captive or traditions that creep into the faith that don't have anything to do with Jesus, like the color of a carpet or even sometimes religious practices, like maybe praying through beads or something like that. The second category is according to elemental spirits. Now, the Greek phrase here is difficult to translate. Uh, the, the translators have different difficulty, and so when you look at your different translations and you did a comparison, you're going to see them picking different words to come across that. They actually propose three options. Um, the last two are the most valid, but the third is an option, though it's probably not what Paul intended. The first option is that it means the elemental building blocks of the physical world, uh, such as atoms. And that just really doesn't make sense with all those philosophies that are, and, and, and vain deceit based on uh, the building blocks of the world. That just doesn't make sense, right? So probably doesn't mean that. But it could be translated that way. The second option is that it means the elemental teachings of the world uh, and that is how the NIV, the New King James, the NASB uh, translate it. Now, it could be, and then they're saying it in parallel. This is a possibility, uh, and it's now in parallel to human tradition. And, and, and you could take it this way, um, meaning that they think this is just basic stuff, elementary stuff, um, that is uh, uh, needed. Um, and don't be taken uh, captive by those, and, and, and it could mean that. The third is, option is that it means the elemental spirits of the world, which is how ESV and the Net Bible translate it. Elemental spirits, elements, right? Uh, what are some elements? Air, water, fire, earth. Those are elements. So, given the first century culture, the background of the supernatural world, they believed in elemental spirits. They believed in the spirit of fire. They believed in the spirit of earth. They believed in the spirit of wind. You can even uh, go back and look at my little talk on a Wednesday night on the Revelation where I talk uh, real revelation uh, actually reference, references these spirits. Um, and so a first century would be thinking about the spirits, and, and they're saying elemental spirits because, you know, the, they think these elemental spirits govern the world, right? And so we know that God has uh, put uh, uh, angels, if you would, or spiritual beings, Elohim, in charge of the world, right? And, and that they fell, uh, one of them was Satan, okay? But there's others. Uh, in Psalm 82, he judges those. So I think that uh, it is the human element was already covered with human tradition. And I think so the translation of elemental spirits is what Paul's trying to communicate. And he's echoing this idea in Galatians 1, 6 through 8, when he tells the Galatians, I'm astonished that you are so quickly discerning Jesus who called you in the grace of Christ and are trying a different gospel. Not that there is another gospel, but you are, there are some of you who trouble you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. But even if an angel, a spirit from heaven, that's what that means, a messenger from heaven, so a spiritual being, should preach any gospel to you contrary to the one that you have preached, let him be a cause. So some philosophies and deceit, vain deceit, that according to demons, according to spiritual beings, are Islam. Mormonism, Hinduism, New Age, and Satanism. The list could go on for quite a while. I'm not going to make an exhaustive list. But these are sources 
of deceit and philosophies that come into our minds. So may we not be ignorant to the sources of worldly philosophies and the deceit that creeps into our lives, taking us captive. Yes, they're human, and yes, they are spiritual. They are demonic. They, they come from fallen spiritual beings who want the glory, want the honor for themselves. Church, let's see to it that we're not taken captive by anything other than Jesus, the all in all. Amen? Being rooted, built up, and established as we walk in and with him through life. Let us pray. Father God, we thank for the opportunity and the privilege it is to be in you and to be taken captive by you, not by philosophies, not by vain deceit, but by you, rooted, built up, and established in you. We ask this to walk out in our hearts as we walk by faith in you and with you. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand.